Okay, so let's start We're looking at Anthony Brown's book, Voices in the Park, an absolute classic, one that I recommend to read to all students of every age, because the amount of layers that you find in this book are endless, and they go on and on and on. So I'd always start with a prediction on this one. I'd also even point out that it's a winner of an award. That's also quite interesting, and that books have awards, and you can publish and be recognized quite well. And... I would start by looking at the environment, looking at the trees. What does this tell you about the time that this book is set in? So possibly autumn. You have that lovely amber. There's a lovely earth colours pushing through. You have, interestingly enough, these two children straight in the centre. We don't know exactly what they're doing. We can make guesses. We don't even actually know what they are. We assume they're humans, but as we'll find out, there's sort of monkeys and chimps and apes. This interesting shape in the background we can talk more about. Anthony Brown's very famous for blurring the lines between the surreal and the real fantasy and uh, non-fiction. And of course we have the two playful dogs here, which is going to be woven through the whole story as we go. Finally, we leave at the title itself, Voices in the Park. Really big question mark on whose voices, when, where. Children have a lot of fun, a lot of predictions to try and understand what this book could be about. This is the first voice. I'm going to start with the picture before I go into the actual words. We can see what the picture says already about the characters in the book. We have a white house. This house is not afraid. This neighborhood is not afraid of what is happening around it. It feels quite safe. The doors are open. The windows are wide open. There's no security needed. The actual fence itself is is sort of, uh, it's not closed. It's not guarded. It's welcoming in some sense. It's very picturesque. We have the autumn scene continued along the background. And then we have these figures here, this family. We see the mother standing. There's what we think is the child and there's a dog being walked. We can get ideas of the mother, the kind of person. We can do a roll on the wall here. We can talk about all the different uh, symbols and items that the mother's wearing, which suggests the kind of character that the mother is. So the posture itself, you know, there's no bend in the back. That would be unseemly for a woman of this stature to have. The red hat shows the sort of prestigiousness. There's some leather gloves, which we'll see more of in the next picture. The mother is walking, uh, f you know, taking the center of the scene here. She's the most important compared to her son. This is a further uh, recognized as the book goes on, further drawn out. We can also see in the railings, we have this normal typical uh, stand here. And then on this one, we have that hat figure which comes over here this actually comes back later into the book so this is important to remember but this hat the environment is sort of lending itself to the to the dominating persona of this picture it was time to take victoria our pedigree labrador and charles our son for a walk okay interesting combination of uh, objects here we have victoria which is the dog that said first and then Charles, the son, for that said second. So you would think that in the hierarchy or the order of the family, you'd say your son and your and your pet. Um, but in this voice, in this view, the mother is actually saying the dog comes first, the child comes second. Interesting word here, pedigree. Pedigree being obviously uh, an animal or the dog, which is born out of the same breed. Um, so that's the Labrador, Pedigree Labrador, and it's important that you know that we could have gotten that from it was time to take Victoria, our Labrador, and Charles, our son, for a walk, but we're emphasizing the importance or the prestigiousness of the Labrador. The Labrador also has a name, Victoria, which is very human-like. It's a very upper, it's a very highbrow kind of name, Victoria, uh, and Charles, you wouldn't know there's a difference if you were just given the names Victoria and Charles their royalty um, language. This is sort of pointing to the attitude that the mother has towards uh, prestigiousness and also to her child and pet. 
finally we can see the font itself is very and font is important because it comes later on in the four different voices the font itself is also representative of the kind of person who is thinking it's uh elegant it's neat yeah okay let's read this page when we arrived at the park i let victoria off her lead immediately some scruffy mongrel appeared and started bothering her I shoot it off, but the horrible thing chased her all over the park. Lovely. So this another word comes up, mongrel, good noun phrase, scruffy mongrel. Scruffy is just sort of emphasizing the uh, sort of the disgustness of the mongrel. Mongrel here being bred by a dog that's been born out of two different types of dogs coming up. Uh, two different dogs and started bothering bothering her of course it would bother her that's what mongrels do and of course it's it happened immediately i shooed it off good verb shooed didn't say i i waved it off i told it to go off i shooed it off and that lends itself again to that poshness shoo shoo that you would hear you know many polite posh people saying but the horrible thing chased her all over the park we can see in this picture again the mother takes center stage. She's the biggest gravity here. She's the biggest presence. Charlie is slightly mentioned through his shadow, but they're two little toes. That's all that Charlie really has uh, in the mother's uh, horizon at this moment. Here we have that nonsense dog with a scruffy mongrel here. And of course, in the background, we always have lovely things that are happening. This looks sort of fairy tale like. It looks like there's a princess here. Looks like a, a, a robber or a knight or Robin Hood even. So there's a sort of interesting play over here. And we have these two buildings in the background, which is also going to be woven through. Still, we get the idea it's autumn. We have the amber, Mediterranean, uh, browns and reds and oranges coming through. Let me just move my camera. I ordered it to go away, but it took no notice of me whatsoever. Sorry. Sit, I said to Charles, here. So we have in this first bit of information, I ordered it to go away. So the mother's, the object in this sentence is the scruffy mongrel, but it took no notice of me whatsoever. Sit, I said to Charles, here. You can easily think that this second bit of information with Charles is the mongrel. If it didn't say, I said, sit, if it didn't say Charles and said to the mongrel, you could easily think that that's correct. So Anthony Brown has very subtly woven these two objects, um, these, two, uh, these two bits of information and made them almost overlap each other. The dog, mongrel and the Charles and Charles himself. And also this is a command word which you'd give to dogs here. And it's very simplistic information. In the background, we have, of course, some more interesting things that are happening. The dogs are playing around sort of seamlessly, carelessly. They're not understanding the difficulty that Charles is facing. We have this strange man in the background. Could be the man in the other page. But he's carrying this sort of funny crocodile-shaped animal or shadow. We know we think it's a shadow because we have the, it's the same color as the other shadows. But again, we have Anthony Brown here sort of putting in his classic surreal and realistic uh, um, ideas into the picture, dreamlike, non-dreamlike. We get a clue of something here, a possibility. Uh, we have the Charles looking out to this side. There's something else here. There's something else going on here, which we won't know until the end. Very good activity you could do here. You're looking at the mother and the, the son. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And how do you know? Lots of children will say sad, upset. You need to sort of push that and say, well, how do you know they're feeling sad? How do you know they're feeling upset? Well, you can see that he's got his eyebrows are turned down. There's no smile. It's also the absence of things. His arms are crossed. It's a very defensive posture. His mum is, of course, feeling um, completely appalled. Her, her body is facing away. She will have none of it. Her eyes are closed shut she's got a frown on her face again we can see the prestigiousness the poshness we have the earrings the uh, pearl necklace we have that nice you know there's those lovely colors here 
and the the tall leather boots and covered in layers she can afford it i was just i was just planning what we should have to eat that evening when i saw charles had disappeared oh dear where had he gone you don't know here if she's actually uh, sad that she's missing him or if it's like uh, a frustration what you do see in this sentence i'll read this page you get some frightful types in the park these days i called his name for what seemed like an age so in this picture you have the example of the frightful sorry the frightful type oh gosh you get an example of the frightful type here um, which is a character which will come up in the next few pages uh, she's looking around. What you notice here is the shadow is uh, sort of become another animal. It could be seen as a wolf howling. You have the mum's face in panic. The trees are also representing the inner world of the mum, which is very lovely. Absolutely good. I'd recommend this for students in year four onwards, maybe year three, uh, so seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, to try and get the environment to match the inner state like the clouds were crying that's a lovely way of saying uh, in a dramatic scene of sadness but here you have the trees all in shock and horror just like the mother some have eyes again we see the dogs playing carelessly they don't really care and we have the strange sort of crocodile shape in the background still sort of where it was before but slowly trotting onwards in this scene, the mother is calling out, shouting out. Dogs are in the background, again, woven in perfectly. In the mother, beautiful close-up, beautiful close-up. You can see all that lovely jewellery, all those lovely bright colours, the expensive-looking gown over here. And the trees are being blown by this call of the mother. It's a lovely exaggeration of what's going on. Well, this, this outside world is complementing. It's showing you the inner world of the mother. Uh, you can't... We all know you can't blow a leaf through it with a shout, but the internal struggle and pain is being pushed out onto nature itself, being blown off the page. Then I saw him talking to a very rough-looking kid. Charles, come here, at once, I said. And come here, please, Victoria. We walked home in silence. Okay, so we have... Uh, the beginning picture, the title. So this is a nice little aha moment. It's a nice little link. So we have these two children. Now we know they're not brother and sister because it's a very rough looking child. So this is more of a clue of what could be happening. Dogs are playing the background again. Very interesting. We have also a really lovely uh, clarification of how the mother feels about the child versus the dog. We have Charles come here at once. Again, very instructional, very direct, I said. And come here, please, Victoria. Please is, you would say that if you said please to someone, you recognize, uh, or you have a bit more empathy, you have a bit more connection with that, that person, a bit more respect for that person is when you'd say please. So you can see the priorities of the mother being shown here in her language and speech. This is a nice sentence here. We walked home in silence. Anthony Brown chooses to cut this off from the paragraph above it has its own weight to it it's really emblematic of what is going on or, uh, or what is meant to be felt in this page we walked home in silence very sad very serious and therefore it deserves its own place we have this final picture of the first voice we have a burning bush which children can talk about forever they can say well what does this actually represent we could talk about how it's the burning of hope this garden which offers all this brightness is is burning is going away it was um taken away from charles by her tyrannical mother the two buildings in the background which will come over and over again we can see a um some kids can say a caged bird like paper but i think it's a bit of a stretch <laughs> you can see these leaves walking as footprints and they're following Charles, or Charles is, Charles is leaving these leaves behind. You can have an interesting pun here. They were leaving the scene, which is always a bit of a laugh. But also, you can see that leaves are the... Um, it's autumn, and this is descending into the winter. 
which Charles is doing as he goes home. He's going into the winter here, um, into the bleak, into the the most arguably the most saddest time of the year where everything is dead. And this is what what he's trotting on. This is what he's feeling as he's walking, and nature is representing what he feels. Mother, of course, has the stern posture. Her face has a very direct uh, expression on it. You know she's upset. There's no doubt about it. Again, she covers Charles. Charles is, doesn't have much of a presence in this scene. In the mother's world, it's Charles needs to be hidden. Charles needs to be unknown. And that's exactly what uh, how she sees him. Second voice. All right, let's look at the picture and the font. First, you can see, obviously, the picture is probably a common scene. You have a lot of people sort of ending up like this. Very, quite sad. Uh, I'd imagine a TV over here, and the TV's blurting out all this uh, light, and it's casting this big shadow here. The dog is in the background. The dog looks does not look happy at all, and that's a nice environmental um, complement of what this man is feeling. The font itself is bold. It's heavy. It's weighted. So the second voice is kind of like this. It's very imprinted. It's very trenched. It, it, it nicely relates to what the father is feeling. I needed to get out of the house. So me and Smudge took the dog to the park. This is the voice of this man. It's, yeah. Here we go into our uh, picture over here. Let me move my camera. So uh, we'll, we'll look at this picture as a line, starting from the bottom. We have this broken heart over here. Very important because there's another similar picture coming up where it's restored and repaired, but a broken heart. And we sort of led through this picture by that line in the background. We can sort of uh, see it. It's kind of like points straight to the father. But we start here with a broken heart. We look at these two portraits, these two paintings, the Mona Lisa here, obviously. This is, I don't know what this is, which is bad because I studied art. Um, yeah, but we have these two portraits with very sort of frightening, sad faces. Again, the world around the father is, or the dad is, represented in the, in the environment around him. Uh, we can have a conversation about this puddle. Is it tears? Is it rain? Did it rain? And the rain caused these faces to turn. Or have these actual paintings been uh, crying? We can talk here about how art is meant to capture feelings in one sense, in one argument. Art is a representation of feelings. And therefore, what would the father be feeling? Sometimes you can talk about how a person is depressed and they don't really have the... It's hard to sort of see, but you can definitely see it in their environment. You can see like a um, unkept room or a unkept kitchen or a laziness about the person which can represent their, their inner world and what they're going through father is walking talking to bumps into this uh this man santa claus wife and millions of kids to support very interesting picture here uh this is a nice philosophy for children lesson um where you can talk about poverty and the role of poverty and the role of what we we should do in the face of poverty Dog is happy, father is sad, Smudge, of course, is smiling, she's happy. She's not actually concerned. She doesn't see the sadness that the father, the father's inner world is painted around. She's definitely in her own world. The two buildings in the background come in again. The trees are sort of um, sagging down. We have the glass barricaded, uh, boundaried um, existence that the father perhaps is feeling. He loves it there. I wish I had half the energy he's got. So there's the father talking about how much the dog loves it there. The dog is so excited. He's coming off the box, off the page. There's so much energy that the tail is wagging. The father seems slow. It's a very static image there. Here we have some interesting things in the background. We have what could be a reference to Mary Poppins, very um, famous um, character, or it could just be the harshness of the weather, the dead trees, the violent wind. You know, this person's definitely taking color. This I'm a bit unsure of. I say to kids, it's a colorless rainbow. It kind of looks like a colorless rainbow. You can argue that. It could be a spotlight. It could be anything. But it's an interesting little thing here. 
Again, the two buildings in the background, they're walking further from those two apartment blocks. It's sort of suggested, I think, that the apartment blocks are housing the uh, most of uh, this, this family. Actually, that's incorrect because the mother comes out of a white picket fence house. But in any case, the buildings are there. The dogs are what I think running through the park. I say this, I thought this was a path before, but I say this because you have a much more whiter um, layer here, and then you have a not so white layer here. So this suggests speed of the dogs running through the forest. Uh, this is a very interesting <laughs> picture. Lots of children uh, will question this. What is this about? Again, it's the dreamlike, it's the unreal uh, of what could be happening that Anthony Brown is so famous for doing. We have the elephant in the background, the big trunk over here, and then we have the foot over here. And this light is quite suggestive of, uh, sorry, um, helps support the idea that there, is, there actually is a path. It could be both. We don't know. Again, this lovely image of the forest is a lot what children would experience when at night time they're seeing, you know, twigs moving in the background and they imagine claws are scraping at the window. It's a really good comment on the deep, dark forest um, um, metaphor or image, sorry, of strange things uh, occurring, uh, weird things, uh, big things, scary things, unfamiliar things occurring. I settled on a bench and looked through the paper for a job. I know it's a waste of time, really, but you've got to have a bit of hope, haven't you? Then it was time to go. Smudge cheered me up. She tattered, chatted happily to me all the way home. So we have a few things here. Father um, is talking. He says it's a. He's reading through the paper for a job, and he says it's a waste of time, really. That suggests that there's repetition. He's done this before. It's a waste of time. He knows the pattern. You look for a job, you apply, you don't get anything back. But you've got to have a bit of hope, haven't you? Lovely little contraction there. Contraction. Um, contraction. So one, two, three. But there's hope. There's hope there, which is very nice. You can talk about where he might get hope from. You can make a link to Smudge. Then it was time to go. Smudge cheered me up. She chatted happily to me all the way home. Again, you can talk about the relationship between verb and adverb. So here we have this beautiful picture. Sorry, I'm just trying to find out where to put my camera up. Nope, nope, nope. All the way to the start. Mm. So here we have the first picture. Now something's different. Those pictures have come alive in Smudge's world, which has now spilled over to the father. In Smudger's world, these people are dancing. In the father's world, these people weren't even people. They were just objects on the side of the road. So it starts to lend the idea, were these people in the first place, or are they actually people, or are they portraits? Is Smudger's idea of this world more accurate with actual people, or is the father's idea of the world more accurate where there actually are just objects and portraits so a lovely idea of perspective there we have santa dancing santa wasn't asking for money santa was dancing there were no crying uh portraits or paintings they were just people dancing and they're dancing in this lovely romantic way this is how smudge sees the world who's to say who is right we have of course them heading home. So here are the footprints. It's white footprints. We can say it's snow, but we haven't seen snow yet. So I would say that this is hope. This is purity. This is Smudge's innocence and purity being laid out behind him as she walks. She takes care of the dog, and of course, the heart is restored. In the background, we have this uh, now not a lamppost, but a stem and a floral, fl uh, floral, a flower. Uh, petaled, shimmering, bright wh white light object coming out here, shining happiness onto the father. The stars are bright. Then we have a triumphant monkey with a shooting star. And we have these buildings full of color. There's no glass. There's no barricade or fence. Again, whose reality is real? What is real? Is it 
is there an object and this gets very deep is there an objective truth or is it a subjective interpretation a subjective truth in smudge's world there's surely no such thing as the previous obstacles that the father saw here we have the third voice now this is the son of this is charles the son of the woman uh, looking at the picture it's got this um why does this happen there we go if i click and if i zoom in then i can move it mm -hmm. so uh, we can see the, the crosshatch drawing it's all blends in all blends into the same thing i was at home on my way again sorry i was at home on my own again it's so boring then mummy said that it was time for our walk this supports the idea that it's boring we can see these cross hatches you know the, the same thing is repeated hall after hall after hall after hall the dog is but a sort of a breath of fresh air amongst this again he again uh, against this uh repetitive background even charles is sort of smudged into the background he sort of disappears within to it the writing is faint the writing is not bold it's not um, necessarily posh it's faint almost unseen again a representation of how charles charles might be feeling this sentence I, I, lo I love short sentences it's so boring this sentence deserves its own time its own space it's a short sentence for impact it's so boring the author wants you to stop here take this into consideration understand it there was a very friendly dog in the park and victoria was having a great time i wished i was her so we can see here here is uh -huh, i knew that would happen here's charles and the shadow of the mum is coming over and interestingly the shadow of the mum is taking over the son we can see that the tyranny of the mother is is taking over charles and he feels that he feels like his you know the burden and the, the weight of his mother is coming over him his uh, shoulders are hunched he can see people playing you can see a family in the background some children would say that that's smudge the father and the dog but we know the dogs already run off but still we can see a family in the background interesting shapes again we have the shape of the mother's hat the presence of the mother is is pushed out projected out onto the environment the mother's hat the mother's hat the mother's hat in the lights the mother's hat in the clouds the mother is everywhere absolutely everywhere except we have little splashes of hope we have the clouds and the blue sky sky in the in the lights we have the dogs playing kids possibility or everyone else is having fun i'm certainly not having fun Do you want to come on the slide a voice asked it was a girl unfortunately but i went anyway she was brilliant on the slide she went really fast i was amazed so <laughs> lovely language here do you do you so we get the voice of smudge here we can see that she's a child she's uh, contracting words that we don't usually contract in standard english do, do you wanna wanna come on the slide question mark a voice asked it was a girl unfortunately of course it's unfortunate charles is a boy he doesn't want to have to listen to a girl and the girl is the one who's taking lead she's saying you know do you want to come with me so it's like oh this is a girl Ugh, girls yuck 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 but i went anyway she was brilliant on the slide lovely lovely word here uh she went really fast i was amazed short sentence for impact in the picture itself we can see charlie's world dark sinister uh, sort of hope hopeless and then we have the spring coming in of uh smudge's world flowers are growing we have the trees in full bloom this looks like a castle not two buildings uh, we also have the dog we have victoria here running from this world because she lives in this world victoria into the uh the world of the dog over here into smudge's world which is bright and filled up so there's a nice transition point over here happening this of course is uh the exact same scene that we had in the start where smudge where charles was looking over you can see half the body so this is the meeting point 
Here's the scene. We have Charles coming down the slide. We have Smudge smiling. We have the dogs playing really happily in the background. Looks like sort of tall people as well. And the clouds there. What I love about this is we have the slide breaking out of. Charlie has to take the leap. Breaks out of the page. Breaks out of the box that he lives in. And who's there to encourage him? We have Smudge. So Smudge is the sort of the saving. If we're looking at... Um, this isn't necessarily a narrative of problem, a beginning build up, problem, etc. But we can have here the resolution in a sense. This is the, the hope. The broken toy, sorry, the broken toy is another symbol. You could talk endlessly about this and it's very subjective. I would see planes as a way of transition, as a way of hope, moving from one place to the other. The broken toy has, a, the, the plane has a broken wing, which suggests that Charlie is this sort of playful, uh, hopeful character, but yet is somehow damaged in some sense. And this is going to be sort of saved possibly by, unfortunately, a girl. We have these uh, flowers, of course, cropping up as well. Here we have a lovely, um, I'll just zoom in a tiny bit. I'll move my camera over here. We have, uh, I'll read it first and go through the pictures. The two dogs raced round like old friends. The girl took off her coat and swung on the climbing frame, so I did the same. In this picture, we can see the union of the dogs. It's the first time. I think this is a very clear image of the um, the union of the boy and the girl, as well as the dogs. You can almost think that the dogs are like old friends. Uh, sorry, that the people are like old friends. And this is represented, the people are behaving like old friends, and this is represented by the dogs behaving like old friends and they're racing around so there starts to be a familiarity with fun and playfulness that charlie's feeling i don't know too much about these statues i'm sure they say a lot but i, I can't figure it out in the background we have this as representative of this union we have full blossom we also have these optical illusions click nope i haven't worked it out zoom in there we go we have these optical illusions the vase or the vase or the vase and the faces which are facing each side again it's a union of two people as one two people as one two personalities as one so we have that all through the background you can do a whole art lesson on this on optical illusions and i guess we have the two people here we have all the plants in full blossom green bright colors no more do we have charlie's coat heavy coat we also have the person uh, in action. Again, Charlie's a bit hesitant. He's not really moving, but he's giving it a go. You can talk a bit about these tentacles. Are they tentacles? Are they an animal or are they just leaves? I'm good at climbing trees, so I showed her how to do it. She told me her, ma her name was Smudge, a funny name I know, but she's quite nice. Then Mummy caught us talking together and I had to go home. Maybe Smudge will be here next time. So, first time, hmm, what does that happen? First time, uh, Charlie shows her something. There's a sharing here of skills and ability. I have something to show. There's something worthy about me. So, Charlie is taking, uh, sorry, this is the first time you see Charlie smiling as well. Very, very important. First time. And you can talk about this to a bigger picture of um, the sharing of knowledge uh, together of me teaching you and you teaching me something, when that happens, that is sort of a true happiness. If I'm helping you and you help me, there's a real recognition of uh, purpose, place and friendship. And this tree, I like to say, is taking you up. It's leading the eye up into possibility where smudges and smudges going up, up higher and higher. And Charles is seemingly unafraid to go up and again we have that full environmental complement of the blossom uh, flowers blossoming sort of reinforcing that idea of of shared of a community shared community shared skills we have the mother going home interesting here if you remember in in um the perspective of the mum that uh, Charlie was leaving uh, 
leaves, which you can argue still, these could be leaves. They're definitely uh, white in some places. I would like to say that Charlie is now taking a bit of the purity of smudge. So you could talk about that as well. There's a bit of hope. There's a question. The light is nice and bright. We also have Cupid or a different kind of Cupid. It's a monkey Cupid. And he's shooting the arrow of uh, love or of not love, but of liking, of hope towards Charlie. So that's a nice little um, reinforcement that there's a there's been a relationship that has formed. We have the zoom out. We have the buildings in the background. It's sort of changed shape. You can argue that you, there's a bit of a face here. I think it's a bit of a long shot. Final voice. <laughs> Dad had been really fed up, so I was pleased when he asked, when he said we could take Albert to the park. Albert's always in such a hurry to be let off his lead. He went straight up to his lovely dog and sniffed his bum. He also, he always does that. Of course, the other dog didn't mind, but its owner was really angry. The silly twit. So interesting here, you can see the font. It's play. This is smudge, the fourth voice. It's playful. It's dancing on the page. It's also bold. It stands out, just like smudge's personality. We can see that this is a familiar scene because uh, the dog always hurries off. Of course, the other dog didn't mind. So smudge is familiar with this. Smudge is familiar with this scene of going out. You can see the language that Smudges uses. Smudge uses its bum, silly twit. Again, this is sort of street talk. This is that sort of risky, daring kind of personality shooting through into the language that she actually thinks. Lovely comment here on different types of frontal adverbials. Of course, the other dog didn't mind. That kind of thing. Well, uh, yeah. Um, also, nice comment on brackets or parentheses. Parentheses, yeah, brackets. I'll keep it as brackets. We can see here in this picture. If I click, sorry, everyone, I'm just trying to learn. There you go. So to click, mm, I'm learning new things every day. We have here um, Smudge's perspective going in. Now, remember, this is all happening on one day. We actually don't know the season. We think it's autumn, we think it's winter. It has the feeling that it's going through the whole year, but really we're looking at the season of the internal world, which is a lovely comment on how feelings uh, change, come and go, or are different for other people. You might want to reference Inside Out for this, the movie Inside Out, because that also talks about how there's different feeling tones, different colors inside uh, any one person. So Smudge's feeling tone is of course spring, um, summer summer so things are coming into life things are colorful there are fruits bursting trees there's like towers filled with it could be lollies or whatnot but stacked colorful towers you have the full uh, fro full throttle mother's face the angry silly quote silly twat and the mother here the bouncing with flowers and life um <laughs> very interesting very animated very animated in smudges world things are animated the button even has a frown the mother of course is thinking endlessly and tirelessly about the dogs the dogs seem like they're running through her head that's the horizon line is carrying itself through the head the clouds give extra expression for the anger uh, that the mother is feeling but again it's all playful it's all playful and that just like the writing tells us about smudge's personality i got talking to this boy I thought he was a bit of a wimp at first, but he's okay. We played on the seesaw and he didn't say much, but later on he was a bit more friendly. This is again is that scene where you have Charles sitting down, you see the person next to him, and this is her uh, perspective. In the background, click. Haha, uh -huh, I'm getting there. In the background you have the f uh, fruits of summer, summer fruits bursting. Again, it's not that dark, wintry, autumn feel. It's a summer, colourful um, uh, idea. Here we have um, Smudge uh, really having fun. She's at the top. We have that sort of weight that Charles carries with him, represented, arguably, as he's sitting on the bottom of the seesaw. He's still weighted by his experience, while Smudge is high up in the clouds, high up in the in the sky we have the two dogs playing of course and then we have the silhouette of the 
uh, gorilla, the gorillas in the background, Anthony Brown just having a bit of fun here. We both burst out laughing when we saw Albert having a swim. Then we all played on the bandstand and I felt really, really happy. So important, she has to say it twice. Really, really happy. So there's lots of playful stuff here with the fountain. Things are happening everywhere. Are they really wearing these swimmers or is this just in Smudge's imagination? In fact, things are so happy, so playful that the trees themselves, we have the fin of the tail of a whale. And then, of course, the blowhole, we have the water bursting out. So nature itself seems to want to be a part or is part of this very playful, bright colourful scene. It's got a lot of activity. And finally, in this picture, we have the union of the playful dogs with the playful children. In fact, in the background, I still struggle to see, if any, any of the un sort of surreal motifs in the background. I don't think it exists because of right now, Charlie and smudge are completely in the moment there's no need to disassociate there's no need to imagine anything else it's because they exist right now in the present in this picture in this completely colorful brilliant image with the playful dogs they've reached that target of playfulness that we can see and have seen and carelessness of the dogs throughout the whole picture Charlie picked up a flower and gave it to me. Then his mum called him and he had to go. He looked sad. So here we have uh, finally an understanding of what happened at the front of the title of this book. We know now that Charlie was giving a flower uh, to um, the girl to smudge. It also has that sun feeling and bursting out like rays. So it has this um, lovely um, metaphor of of sunlight, of promise, of burst, of, of romance. It has all of this sort of stuff weaving out of it. The trees are, although nighttime, the trees are sort of sparkling with all the flowers. Again, we have this short sentence of impact. He looked sad, important enough to be on its own, a clause that sits on its own. There he is. He looks sad. Interestingly, he takes more of the image, and I think even more so, it's his face which we've struggled to see a lot in the mother's light, in the mother's perspective. His face grabs all the attention now. He looked sad. It's the last sentence that is said, and it's left in this image of the look. He's looking sad. We don't have necessarily the happy ending that we wanted. It can be argued there is a happy ending, but with the uh, the giving of the flower, the 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 symbol of. Uh, it's sort of concreting the idea of union and partnership and relationship here and friendship. But um, in this final scene, life goes on. There's a reality behind Charlie, Smudges, also Victoria and, and the other, the mongrel, um, Patrick, I've forgotten the name. But there's a reality that life sort of goes on. And we have the mother taking Charlie back to his prison, his home. There's a bit of color there, though, so that's promising. Okay, so that's it. That's my little analysis of the book. It's a fantastic book, Voices in the Park, Anthony Brown. Really recommended, really recommended. I hope this is helpful, that you've seen different things here, that you could talk things out with your class. Any age group, I think this is absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, all the best.